We are studying, as most of you know who have been to our congregation even once in the last few months, uh, know that we're studying the book of Joshua. And it is, an ex it, is an, uh, it is a very different kind of book because most of the books that we've looked at in the past have, been, have dealt with uh, things other than what Joshua does. Joshua is dealing with uh, historical uh, events. And so it's a book about history. Now, I don't know about you, but when I was growing up, history was like a yawner. The only thing that I found less interesting than history was when I got to college and we started studying economics. <laughs> and if I ever had difficulty falling asleep, open up my Samuelson economics book, I'd be out in no time. But Joshua is actually a fascinating historical book, and as the years have gone by, I've come to appreciate history much more than I did as a young man. Uh, the goal, as you know, of the entire book of Joshua is summarized in these few words, conquer the promised land. That's what the goal that was given to Joshua was to do, conquer the promised land. How do you do that? The means were given to him when God said and promised him, I will be with you. You're not going to do this alone, Joshua. And by the way, if you try to do it alone, you'll find out it doesn't work so well. As many of us find out in life when we try to do it without the Lord, things don't work so well. The setting of the book of Joshua, that, uh, the place that we're at right now, is we're at the end of uh, chapter 10. And everybody remembers, of course, what happened in chapter 10, right? At the very end... This is the end of chapter 10, the last couple of verses. Joshua had captured all these kings and their lands. These are the kings that were in the south and the lands that were in the south of what we commonly call today the land of Israel. At that time, it was called the land of Canaan, Canaan. And they were, Joshua had captured all these kings. There was, remember, a list. It, we didn't go through in very great detail, but we did talk about the fact that there were the five kings who formed a coalition, you remember, and Joshua fought against all five. And, of course, he uh, was victorious there. And then he goes on to conquer other cities and towns and, and kings as well. So that, that, we didn't go through every one, but if you look at the, uh, the uh, last half, I'll say, the last 15 verses or so of chapter 10, you'll see a, a, quite a list of other cities and kings that Joshua uh, conquered in the south. And in verse 43, the last verse in chapter 10, so Joshua and all Israel with him, which I love that phrase, remember, Joshua and all Israel with him, returned to the camp at Gilgal, which was the place that they had started out from, kind of like a sanctuary where, where those who were not involved in the war, in the warriors, this is where the, the wives and children and uh, so on uh, stayed while the, uh, the men who were fighting the, uh, the wars um, were busy taking care of business. And so they, the area that was encircled, Gilgal means circle, it was like a, a sanctuary area that they set up for the people to stay. And uh, that was near, does anybody remember where Gilgal was? Well, you'll find out in a moment if you haven't, <laughs> you haven't visited downtown Gilgal lately, huh? All right, we'll show you where it is. So, so now after basically taking the entire southern portion of Israel, and returning to Gilgal, which is kind of in the middle of the, of the uh, nation of Israel, uh, what was in the middle of Canaan at that point, Joshua, pretty soon, after a little rest, we don't know how long, decides to begin to move north because his job is not done yet. He's only done the southern area. There's also this part called the north. He's moving north towards a place called Chazor. And so you need a map to understand this properly, right? Okay, people who like maps, I like maps. And uh, you'll see quite a few today because <laughs> it's fascinating. Okay, so here's a map of uh, covering like from the Dead Sea. You can see at the bottom of the screen, Mediterranean Sea on the left there, uh, your left. 
and that uh, another body of water up north, the, uh, uh, the Galil, uh, the Lake of Galilee, or the Sea of Tiberias, it has a number of names, and uh, Kinneret. And uh, there's, uh, okay, so we, just to locate you, here is Jerusalem. There'll be a test, by the way, for all those in Shabbat school. There's going to be a test. No. There's gonna be, you want to understand where things are. Here's Jerusalem. You see it uh, just uh, near the top of the Dead Sea there, about locationally, but a little bit uh, uh, not right next to the Dead Sea, of course. And uh, here was Jericho. See, that's the first town that the Israelites conquered, as you recall. And it happens to be very near to Gilgal, where the Israelites had set up the camp, where the people who are not involved in the war will stay, and where the warriors now who have conquered the south have returned. So the entire nation is back together at Gilgal. But not for long, because Joshua knows he's got work to do. There are three major ways, major roads that go north and south through this area that are not shown on this map. One of them is by the sea. Another one is east of the Jordan uh, in Edom and uh, Moab over there. But there's also a road that goes through the, uh, the mountainous areas there. And that is apparently the route that uh, Joshua and the men are moving forward on. So we pick up the uh, account in Joshua chapter 11. We're moving right along. And then it came about, and I, I'm keeping the map up there because every, a lot of things I'm going to be talking about need to be shown visually so you know where we're talking about. Then it came about when uh, Yavin, in Hebrew, uh, Jabin is uh, the English uh, that we read, we, the Hebrew Yavin, uh, king of Chazor, heard of it. Heard of what? What did he hear of? He heard about Joshua's conquest of the south. And what else did he hear? He's coming up north. That sounds like trouble. So what would you do? Run for the hills? Well, there's Hazor. Hazor is up north, as you can see. It's actually north of the uh, Sea of Galilee there. And... Um, he decides to call for some help. He sent to Yovav, jo Jobab, king of Madon. Now, Madon is a city just uh, west of the Sea of Galilee. Now, I love, that, I love the fact that archaeologists have done all this work for us. Because these towns, a lot of these are long gone. But archaeologists digging around with, you know, shovels and spoons have uh, located a lot of these, not all, but a lot. So Madon, as you can see, is just a little west of, uh, of the Sea of Galilee. And he sent to the king of Shimron, and we don't have the name of that king, but Shimron, archaeologists have found, is a little bit further west of Madon, towards the, uh, the Mediterranean. And to the king of Achshaf. Now these are... Kings, you probably won't remember, but let me show you where Achshaf is. It's over near where modern-day Haifa is. Haifa is on, at the very tip of that uh, portion that sticks out into the uh, Mediterranean. But Achshaf was found over there. So, so these are some of the towns that the king of Hazor sent to. He sent to those kings... And to the kings, it goes on, it wasn't just those. And to the kings who were of the north in the hill country. The hill country is kind of, as you can see, a hilly, a lot of the whole central portion is pretty much hill country. So he, there were unnamed kings and cities and towns in those uh, hills that had been uh, apparently uh, were inhabited and he was aware of them. And to a place called the Arabah. Arabah can mean a desolate area. It's a Hebrew word that is used in several locations. The Arabah, there is no single place called the Arabah. But there, it means a plain or a deserted area, a kind of a pretty much desolate area. And the Arabah that's talked about here, that he's talking about, is this one that's right in what you and I would call the Jordan Valley, the Arabah. Okay? That's, that's where he was... Uh, 
uh, trying to reach the northern kings that would be living in that area, in the Arabah. And, uh, and in not only those who were in the Arabah, uh, but he clarifies which Arabah he's talking about when he says the Arabah that's south of Kinarot. Kinarot is the, uh, on the western side of the Sea of Galilee. And so it's the Arabah that's just south of that, as you can see in that deep depression. This is a, this is a relief map. It, it exaggerates the, the shape of the land, but it gives you an idea, helps you feel for the, the uh, vertical uh, dimensions of the land, uh, what's high and what's low. So the Arabah is in that deep valley, that crease that occupies now the, uh, the uh, uh, eastern side of Israel. Well, it's actually not under Jewish control right now, but uh, that would be on the West Bank. And, uh, and in the lowlands, so he sent to kings who were in the lowlands. The lowlands are towards the coastline. The coastline, which is actually, as you look at your map, it's over on this side. The land, as you can see, it's high in the middle, and then it drops down as it gets near the Mediterranean. And on the heights of Dor on the west, there are some local... Um, uh, areas that are a little higher. Dor is on the very coast of the land of Israel. You can see it just below Ashaf there on the coast. And to the Canaanites, he's still calling, to the Canaanites on the east, now he's not even telling you the names of the towns, never mind the kings, the Canaanites on the east and on the west, and the Amorite, and the Hittite, and the Perizzite, and the Jebusite, which is rather remarkable, he's talking about Jebusites, because where do you think of when you hear the word Jebusite? Jerusalem. This ain't nowhere near Jerusalem. This is north. The Jebusites in the hill country. And the Hivite at the foot of Mount Hermon, which is in the land of Mizpeh. Now, Mount Hermon is at the very, near the very top of this slide, uh, this area. If you see Mount Hermon is way up there. That's, it's kind of whitish because it was, uh, it's a lot of snow that stays here all year round, even. Uh, Mount Hermon is so high. Yeah, that's about 7,000 feet high. They're skiing now on Mount Hermon. You want to go skiing? You ever want, ha, anybody here ski? You ever been at skied Mount Hermon? No, but they, I saw some pictures today of what it looks like on Mount Hermon. Uh, and uh, they have uh, a lot of snow there, and they got ski lifts going on it, which I doubt were there <laughs> during this time frame that we're talking about. No ski lifts there. But if you ever go to Europe, some of you young men and women who are uh, probably going to tour the world and see the rest of it, uh, you might plan, if you're in the winter time frame, I, I'm not sure, it's probably, uh, uh, I don't know what it's like in the summer, it may not be as open, but um, I don't know how much snow they have there, but uh, 7,000 feet, you can have uh, snow there certainly in the winter, and it's a good place to go skiing from what I can see, lots of lifts. They came out, verse 4 it says, they came out, all of these kings and armies that were called by the king of Hazor, the ones he sent for, they came out, meaning the kings. The kings came out and all their armies with them. As many people as the sand that is on the seashore. It's a lot of folks. I thought that that's a little bit of hyperbole. And the Bible does use that now and then. It's like an exaggeration to, to just give you the idea that it was like you couldn't even count the people that had come for this, uh, to this king of Hazor. And not only that, he came, they had very many horses and chariots. You know what? This doesn't look so good. When I read this, and I thought about it. Oh, <clears throat> why did God not tell Joshua, "You better get up there fast before these guys put, pull themselves together"? What's this take, relaxing and taking time in Gilgal and uh, you know having a, a break here? Why did God wait so long? Because now you have a horde that has gathered together. These armies are. As many as the, the sand of the seashore. I mean, it's just 
much greater than he had probably seen when he was fighting in the south. Remember the five kings who formed a coalition. Now we have many times that in terms of warriors. And I thought about this. Israel, how many warriors did they have? Remember went back, there's, you know, they may have a few hundred thousand. I don't know how many, are the, do we have an exact number here. They were successful in all these battles in the south. And now they've got to come against it, probably a much larger army. Where, where are your reinforcements, Joshua? Where is everybody? You're probably greatly outnumbered. I'm thinking, if you were one of those warriors, this might be a good time to exit stage left, you know? I just now, when they were headed up north, just you picture this, they're headed up north after the battles in the south that have been successful. God's help has been primary. And now they're headed up north and they don't know what's waiting for them. Why was God slow in getting them moving? There's a reason. God allows things to happen sometimes for reasons you don't see at the time. Then the Lord said to Joshua, which means take note of the fact that Joshua is in touch with the Lord. I don't think the Lord put a post-it on his, Joshua's refrigerator. Not that they had a refrigerator, right? He's in touch with him. And the Lord said to Joshua, do not be afraid because of them. I have a feeling word got back about what they were facing when they headed up north to all these armies. Do not be afraid because of them. That's easy for you to say, God. For tomorrow at this time, <laughs> I thought about this phrase, tomorrow at this time, that's, that's 24 hours from now, I will deliver all of them slain before Israel. I'm not exactly sure how to take that. I mean, it sounds good if you're Israel. Does that mean that God slew them? It's, if you look at that text, if you take it literally, it says, I will deliver all of them slain before Israel. Or did it mean that when Israel fights against them, they will be victorious? I don't know. I honestly don't know what, what exactly how he meant that to be taken. But if you were one of the warriors who were looking out at all these guys, I think you'd like to take the first one. You walk out there and these guys are dead already. Does God do that kind of thing? Can he do that kind of thing? Remember the hail? Remember the hail that fell only on the, uh, the bad guys down in the south and not on the Israelite warriors? I mean, if you only had somebody like that with you when you're in a, in a war, that's what you were, somebody who can do that. And, and the hail was not small. It was not just, you know, little tiny things, little pebbles. The hail was killing men, but not the Israelites. God says, I will deliver them slain before Israel. Wow. And he goes further and he says, you will hamstring their horses and burn their chariots with fire. Now, I looked up exactly what hamstringing is. Hamstring is when you cut the tendons in the, behind the knee so that you can still move, but you don't have the strength or the mobility that you had before. So these, when you do that, the horse can still move and even carry a load, but it probably, it can't function in a warlike environment where there's rapid change of direction, stopping and forwarding and racing forward and so on. All of that disappears when a horse has uh, been hamstrung. And he says, you're going to burn their chariots with fire. Now, is that smart? 
Do you think that's a smart idea? If you were, if you were Joshua and you've captured all these chariots and these horses, I think I would have said, hey, we've got, these are weapons in those days. These, these horses are worth, I mean, in, in war, these are valuable. And I don't think Israel had a lot of them, if any. And they certainly didn't have chariots coming out of Egypt unless they went back into the Dead Sea and pulled those out. No. Why do you think God told Israel to destroy these weapons of war? You think, you think this is going to be the last battle? No. Even though you got all of these guys coming out against you. Maybe it'd be good, Lord, to kind of keep some of these, you know, in case we need them against these guys, some other groups. God said, destroy those. You think maybe he was telling them something? If you're depending on chariots and horses, guess who you're not depending on? You're not depending on me. And you know, I, uh, I, I find myself in my mind thinking back of what it was like there and putting myself there, but I also want to bring it forward. And I think to myself of modern day Israel who has built up a great army and, you know, they have aircraft which we have helped them acquire and, and they have a navy and, you know, I mean, they have military equipment and weapons. They have the latest technology. They have missiles. They have anti-missile missiles. They have, I mean, these guys have really, in fact, the nations around them, I think, recognize that Israel has probably got the edge when it comes militarily. So I think there's a tendency on the part of the Israeli people to say, we are strong. Nobody's going to take advantage of us anymore. Why? Because we can do it. You forgot something. Israel, it's never been about you. It's been about your God. And I fear that the nation of Israel and the leadership has kind of forgotten that to some extent. The fact that they exist at all is not because of anything great they have done, but it's because of the God who's watching over them. And here we have an example of God trying to remind the Israelites, I think, about that. Destroy their weapons. You don't need them. You have me, God says. So you want to know the answer to the question? I called it the first question here, Q1. Question one, why did God wait so long? Because he was increasing their trust in him, reminding them. So... So this is a remarkable thing, too. As I thought about this and what happens, it occurs to me, a lot of these warriors came from towns, some of whom had walled cities, walls around them. By, by allowing them to come out of those walled cities, if they are able to defeat them, at least they don't have to conquer them, you know, they're not protected in their walled cities. You don't have to go and break down the walls of, of each town anymore. Now, Jericho, there was an unusual event there. We know about that. But unless God did that multiple times, if they're in walled cities, that would make it even harder. God said, I'm taking care of you. They gather all together. That's going to make it easier, not harder. God is quite a general. So all of these kings, having agreed to meet, came and encamped together at the waters of Merom to fight against Israel. They think they're coming to fight Israel. They don't know they're coming to fight 
the God of Israel. If they'd have known that, they should have stayed home. Here is where Marom is. The uh, Marom is uh, just a little west, kind of west-northwest, if you know where Safed is, if you've ever been to Israel, the city of Safed up in the, the north of Israel. A little west-northwest is where they've located the remains of what is probably um, uh, Merom. The place, there's a gathering area there, apparently, of where the, uh, all the chariots and horses and so on, that's the place they gathered. And they think they're fighting against Israel. So Joshua and all the people of war came with him. I love that. They're together, folks. You see that? They're a, they're a community. They're sticking with each other. All the people of war came with him, and suddenly, by the waters of Merom, they attacked them. It seems like God is using surprise to confuse the enemy. And I, there's no record of how the battle went, but I'm guessing that that helped it get started. The Lord delivered them, it's, it goes on to say, the Lord delivered them into the hand of Israel, just like he said, so that they defeated them and they pursued them. Now they're running away from Israel. This horde this that's greater than this, the sands of the sea. They pursue them as far as the great Sidon and uh, Misropot Mayim, which uh, is, uh, I'll show you where that is in a moment, but I'll actually tell you. And, uh, the, valley, uh, and the valley of uh, Mispah to the east, and they struck them until no survivor was left to them. Here are those places now. Um, Sidon, as we call it, is up in the very, it's the very north. I don't know if it's even, yeah, you know, it's barely on the screen there in the north, Sidon. And uh, the other term, the Misrafot Mayim, is north of that. It's off our map. It's up near Tyre. Sidon, uh, Tyre and Sidon. You've heard of those, right? They're on the coast, uh, um, both of them, and uh, Tyre is off screen north. And also um, the Valley of Mizpah, we just talked about that, was up near Mount Hermon. So uh, when Israel attacked them, they fled and Israel chased them to Sidon and off the screen north further and also up to the base of Mount Hermon, somewhere there. That would be where they chased them. You kind of get the feeling they're, they're cleaning out the land. They're the ones that don't get killed, and there may have been some, we find out later that there were, although it says no survivor was left to them. Again, it's a, probably a little bit of a uh, hyperbola there because there, we find out later that there really were some, but uh, those were the ones who ran away. Joshua did to them, I, I, and this scripture is just, <laughs> Joshua did to them as the Lord had told them. What a thought. He's actually following God's instructions. And he's having success. And he hamstrung their horses and burned their chariots with fire, destroyed their weapons. Boy, it would have been tempting to keep a few of those, but no. Then Joshua, after doing that, he's up north now. He's got his men are scattered all over the north now. Then Joshua called them back and, and, uh, at that time, and they captured Chazor and struck its king with the sword. For Chazor formerly was what? The head of all these kingdoms. That was why Chazor was the one, the king, who started the whole gathering together. He's the one who called that coalition into existence, called all those kings and all their armies together. Because Chazor is apparently, and it's been... That particular city has been found by name in uh, some of the tablets that have been found over the years in various places around the area. Hazor is mentioned. So Hazor is probably, uh, archaeologists think it was the largest city in the entire area, in all of Canaan. So it's natural that 
the king of that, the larger city would be the one that would call the, uh, the rest together. He's the one that they all looked up to, apparently. But it didn't help them against Israel, not because, uh, because it didn't help them against Israel's king. And they struck every person, the Israelites struck every person who was in it with the edge of the sword, utterly destroying them. There was no one left who breathed. And he burnt Chazor with fire. He didn't do that to many other towns, although they did do that um, with Jericho and with Ha'ai. Those were the only two other towns that are noted that Israel, the Israelites not only killed everybody, they burned it down. Left no one who breathed. Not even the women and children, young children, babies. Seems a little harsh, no? Certainly in our society, it seems a little harsh. But you know what? I asked myself that question again. Why did he do that? Why did, why did Joshua do that? Do you remember Deuteronomy? We keep going back to this, and I keep reminding you because it's still, it's still uh, appropriate. In Deuteronomy chapter 20, beginning at verse 16, we have some words from someone named Moshe, Moses. And he was speaking the guidance, the instruction from, the, from God, and he told them, however, th getting ready now, because remember Deuteronomy is the repeal, he, it's before, it's at the end of Moses' life, toward the end here, the end of Deuteronomy. He's getting ready to depart, giving him instructions for what will happen after, for Joshua. However, in the cities of the nations that the Lord your God is giving you as an inheritance, on the other side um, in Israel, the place you could have gone 40 years ago but chose not to, do not leave anything alive, anything that breathes. Pretty harsh. But these were the instructions. Completely destroy them. The Hittites, the Amorites, the Canaanites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, the Jebusites. God knew what was in there. And Moses was told, and he was telling the people in advance, when you get in there, completely destroy them as the Lord your God has commanded you. Otherwise, here's the explanation. Otherwise, they will teach you to follow all the detestable things that they do in worshiping their gods. Does anybody remember some of those? I, I think it comes to mind the, uh, the sacrifice of babies and children, the worship of Moloch, which was instituted in the land by the Phoenicians and spread through all of Canaan. The very thing, in a way, that God asked Abraham to do with Isaac. Remember? You're going to sacrifice your son Isaac. And he got ready to do that, and God said, stop. We don't do that. Israel doesn't do that. You are to be different than those around you. Don't let these guys grow up around you, because these pagans are going to lead you to do detestable things. I, I, uh, I, I find that true even now in our society. Not quite in the same ways. I don't see people sacrificing babies, although we talk about destroying babies in the womb, okay, unborn. They're not burning them in fires, but maybe they're doing worse. The numbers are probably much bigger. But you can see how some of these things, these, the cultural practices in our country, and in, you know, have, have grown to become commonplace and accepted. And if, and if you're not part of that, well, you're out of it. Come on, get with the program. I can't imagine 
Dude, the le- we think this was 3,400 years ago. And everything's changed since then. You know, everything's changed, but nothing's changed. People are still people. And when you're immersed in a culture that teaches wrong, ungodly things, it's easy to get caught up in that. A lot of our nation is. I hesitate to say, but I I really think the majority are. Wasn't that way when our nation started, but has become that. It's changed a lot even in, in my lifetime. Otherwise, they will teach you to follow all the detestable things that they, they do in worshiping their gods. And here's the worst part. And then you will sin against the Lord your God if you allow them to live. They will teach you these things for sure. Oh, but they're little children. They're women. They we'll teach them. No. Take my word for it, God says. If you allow them to live, they'll bring all the pagan worship into Israel. I'm sorry to report, that's exactly what happened. They did not clean the land out. And they fell into detestable worship. Even the greatest, wisest king of all Israel, Solomon, you thought he'd have a little more sense, if anybody. He's the one who built the the Ashtarot on the high places. Solomon, I thought you were a smart guy. You see, he got carried along. Well, we can just do this in one area. It won't be bad. Really? You will sin against the Lord your God. Joshua captured, that's why all of them were put to death. Everyone that they could find at that point, but it wasn't everyone in the land. These were, these were the warriors and the, the towns that they hit, but there were a lot more left. And we'll find that out later as we move along through Joshua. Joshua captured all the cities of these kings and all their kings, and he struck them with the edge of the sword and utterly destroyed them just as Moses, the servant of the Lord, had commanded I love the fact of, of uh, Joshua's obedience. And Joshua waged war. This text is fascinating. Joshua waged war a long time. Yeah, this didn't happen. You know, we read this. We can read it in an afternoon. And, uh, you know, <laughs> meanwhile, Joshua's out there day after day, week after week. How long did this go on? How long do you think this was? A long time. It says, the scripture says a long time. Well, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to leave that up to, the, to Chuck to teach you at the Chavara group on Monday. It's a plug. He will answer that question for you. So if you want to know the answer to that, you come to the Chavara group. You, may have to make, you might have to put a few more chairs out. Okay, Ann, just, I'm just saying There was not a city which made peace with the sons of Israel, except, remember the Hivites, those are the ones who were living in Gibeon, the Hivites, they were not Amorites, the Hivites in Gibeon, the ones that made peace, okay, they lied about where they lived, and they tricked Joshua into agreeing not to destroy them. There was not a city which made peace with the sons of Israel, except the Hivites living in Gibeon. Israel took them all in battle. They had to win everything. Nobody just said, okay, we give up. Except for the Gibeonites. And why do you think that was? You don't have to guess. For it was of the Lord to harden their hearts to meet Israel in the battle. You see the Lord at work here? You may not have seen it if you were there with Joshua fighting all these battles, says, can't we just skip this town? Why don't we ask them if they have to want to give up? You know, I, I, you can just imagine what was going through the minds of the people. But it was of the Lord to harden their hearts to meet Israel in battle. Why? In order that he might utterly destroy them. 
that they might receive no mercy, but that he might destroy them just as the Lord had commanded Moses, that Joshua would destroy them. There was method to this madness that he put it upon the hearts of the kings to go up against Israel so that they might be destroyed. I mean, I, you know, I, I, it just, uh, it's amazing to think about the, the God who was leading them. And so Joshua, it says, took the whole land according to um, all that the Lord had spoken to Moses. And Joshua gave it for an inheritance to Israel according to their divisions by their tribes, which we're coming to here in the chapters ahead. Joshua gave it as an inheritance. And it says on this last sentence, you've got to love this last sentence. Thus the land had rest from war. Ah, <sighs> Finally. Do you think it had rest from war? No. Well, what do you mean? It says right here. It says right here in black and white or light yellow. And what, what, what do you mean? It says right there. Thus the land had rest. They, it says they, 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 they took the whole land. And, and they had rest. Isn't this whole thing over? I tried to reconcile that, and, and I concluded in my mind as I continued to study the text. I have an answer for that. Chuck is going to give you that answer, too. <laughs> how do I know that the land didn't have rest? You know how the land, I know the land didn't have rest? Look at this. Joshua chapter what? 13. What are we in? Chapter less than you know, two chapters away, we come to this text in Joshua 13, 1, that says, we're jumping a little ahead here just so you catch the drift here. Now Joshua was old and advanced in years. I can relate to that. And, and Joshua was old and advanced in years when the Lord said to him, you are old and advanced in years. <laughs> At which point Joshua probably turned and said, tell me something I don't know, will you? <laughs> you are old and advanced in years, but the Lord's not done. Are you ready? And very much of the land remains to be possessed. Very much. It's not like there's a few odds and ends left over here. Very much of the land. But I thought, it says, Joshua took the whole land. It says there, right in verse 23 of chapter 11. Hmm. How, do we, how do we explain all that? You'll find out on Monday night. <laughs> Let's close in prayer. Alvino, I, uh, I, I, I must confess to you, Lord, that... Uh, your ways are, are higher than man's, and the things that you do um, amaze those of us who uh, don't see how you're working at the time. And we marvel, Lord, we marvel even now at the things that you have done. And it teaches us, Lord, it, the lesson about you. Some of us struggle maybe with the question of how big is our God? How capable, how powerful is He? Can He really solve these problems that I'm facing? Well, surely these problems are too overwhelming even for you, Lord. Not true, you said. Again and again in your word, you remind us of your power. Even in this historical account of the, of the taking of, uh, of the land, again and again, you show yourself powerful beyond our wildest imagination. And Lord, may we be humbled this morning just thinking about you. 
may it remind us how big you are and how much we need you. Help us, Lord. Help us in every area. I know a lot of us here have things that we are working through right now. Difficulties um, that are uh, only you know and they know. Lord, I pray for them right now that they might turn towards you and ask you for your help. Knowing, Lord, that you are anxious to help them if they will only ask. So, Lord, I, I lift up our congregants right here, right now, those who are listening right now. And I pray, Father, that you would show yourself sovereign and powerful to solve the problems and lead us, Lord, in wisdom. We need it so desperately, each and every one of us. You gave that to Joshua and to the Israelites. You showed yourself powerful. Please continue to do that in our times and in our lives. And we'll give you all the praise and the glory. In the precious name of Messiah Yeshua. Amen.